Hey everybody, this is Dr. Mables. We're going to continue our lecture on socialization by learning about some of these great theorists who have given us really cool ideas about social psychology and how we as individuals experience our society by interacting with other people. Now this first one we're going to talk about today of two is a guy named W.I. Thomas. W.I. Thomas is really cool because he and I actually have a connection. He was the first bachelor's of sociology graduate from the University of Tennessee at Knoxville, which is where I went. So it's kind of cool that I have an academic link to W.I. Thomas. Uh, in fact, he's buried in Knoxville, funny enough. Now, I want to talk about one of two ideas that we'll talk about with, talk about with W.I. Thomas. Uh, the first one today is the definition of the situation. Later, we'll talk about the Thomas theorem, but that's going to be in a separate lecture. Um, with definition of the situation, I've given a quote there by W.I. Thomas, but it's the idea that we live so much of our life on autopilot. When our brains walk into a classroom, they immediately assess what needs to happen. You know, if you're a student, you say, oh, I'm a student, I'll go sit down, I'll get my books out, I'll get myself ready. Oh, there's extra time, okay, I'll use my phone to kill some time. Everything is very predictable, and it's very autopilot. Our brains understand what's happening in any particular situation. It's the same thing if you're waiting in line. We understand how waiting in line works. You stand behind the person in front of you. When they're done, you move up one position. And you're going to stand in that line until either you decide to leave the line or the people in front of you are done. We understand how that situation works. It's cool because we live so much of our lives just on autopilot. We don't even really have to think about it. In fact, in many ways, we can just sort of do things automatically and don't have to worry about them. But sometimes that doesn't work out. Maybe you've been at a party where people get um, inebriated and they say something really stupid. You suddenly feel like they've defied the definition of the situation, of what's going on at that moment. Or maybe there's an awkwardness where um, you were trying to do one thing, another person was trying to do something else, and it just doesn't work out. Like you're trying to give a handshake, they're trying to do a high five, and it's just like, oh, 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 oh okay. Or that thing where you're both walking in the same sidewalk, you almost run into each other because one of you is on the wrong side and the other's on the right side, or maybe you're in the center, and you kind of do that little dance thing, and then finally somebody walks past the other one, and it feels awkward. This is where we're getting into the realm of how often our brain just runs on autopilot. So Thomas was predicting this really, or presenting this really cool idea um, that our brain is able to understand more or less what it's able to do. But that's because we've been socialized. In fact, we've been socialized to understand how things work. It's kind of like when you're at um, you know, a place like Chick-fil-A where people will often say, it's my pleasure when you know they give you your food or you say thank you. And it's funny because you can kind of manipulate that a little bit by saying, oh, thank you. And they say, oh, it's my pleasure. And you can almost see how many times that they would say that. Again, our brains just operate on autopilot. But every once in a while, things don't operate on autopilot. And another sociological thinker was very hip to the idea that maybe, just maybe, we can learn a whole bunch about socialization and this definition of the situation idea by actively choosing to interrupt our society's function. That guy was a person by the name of Garfinkel. Garfinkel argued that his field, ethnomethodology, studied society by looking at moments where society was interrupted. Now let's pretend that you're getting into an elevator for a moment. When we get into an elevator, we have a clear understanding about how that works. So you get into the elevator, if you're with someone, you stop talking, you sort of face uh, the center of the door and you just kind of sit there and you're quiet for the ride. Why is that? Well, we've been socialized, that that's the normal thing to do. What happens if you face the wrong way in an elevator? Sometime if you're bored, stand in an elevator facing the wrong way. Watch how uncomfortable people get. Don't, don't freak people out. But you'll see that very quickly people are like, dude, you're facing the wrong way. Maybe you wear the wrong outfit to the wrong kind of event. You, um, you know, wear blue jeans and a t-shirt to an event where you're supposed to have a shirt and tie. Or vice versa, you wear a shirt and tie to the beach. Or you wear a wedding dress to a funeral. These are the kinds of things where we're interacting with our um, the people around us. We're interacting with our social norms, but we're breaking them. We're doing something that's inappropriate. Even little things like asking people, you know, hey, excuse me, uh, I see you're waiting in line in front of me. Can I get in front of you? And not giving them a reason. That's an example of ethnomethodology. You're somehow breaking those requirements, giving high fives at a funeral, totally inappropriate. 
And yet in doing that, we're interrupting society and we're learning a whole bunch about it. What are we learning exactly with ethnomethodology? Well, we're learning where those norms are falling. We learn where those norms sit in our society. We learn these lines that we're not supposed to cross. And when we cross them, we've actually learned quite a bit of how society is socializing us to feel certain ways about things. It's intriguing. What's really wrong about wearing a wedding dress to a funeral? I mean, it seems inappropriate, I guess, but clothes are clothes, right? No, you're violating some norm. Ethnomethodology looks for those moments where we violate norms to understand how society functions. For me, this was a field that really interested me as an undergraduate. And for social psychology as a whole, I think it's probably one of the most exciting ideas out there. It's little things like finding ways to interrupt how society functions on a daily basis. Interrupt what people are expecting. Interrupt what they think they're going to be doing. And then suddenly when things go wrong or go different, you can understand where those norms fall by seeing through Goffman's eyes or Garfinkel's eyes this ethno methodology. Those are our two ideas for today. Remember, we're keeping these lectures super short so you can focus in on these individual ideas. In our next one, we're going to talk about a guy named Goffman and his dramaturgical perspective. If you have questions, if you're not sure about something, you feel free to get in touch with me. I'm always happy to help. Otherwise, I'll see you next time. Take care.